Hi everyone, it's good to be here back in Paris. It's one of the first events I do in Paris. So I'm glad to be here. I just want to walk you through uh, our journey a little bit, uh, how we uh, evolved over the years and how our, our API transformed or didn't transform over these same years. So first I, um, I co-founded Eventbrite eight years ago, so it's been a while. Uh, we were three of us for a couple of years. Um, I was the only tech guy on the team, so I had to do everything. Uh, that's a great learning experience, but you also know the value of time and how to use your time more, more effectively um, and work on the right priorities at the right time. And I think that's a challenge for any company that grows and uh, something you have to face if you uh, build your own startup. Uh, first, some numbers about Eventbrite, where we are today. Uh, we've had two million events running on our platform since we launched. Uh, that's about 150 million tickets sold to date. Um, this year alone, we'll sell a billion dollars worth of uh, tickets. That's a lot of transactions, a lot of volume, a lot of servers running to power all this. And uh, we've had events pretty much all over the world. Um, one big factor also that affected our architecture is that now we have um, uh, more than 100 people who are working on product and engineering. That's a big difference from just having me running everything. Uh, that of, of allows us to afford a lot more luxury into the time we spend on architecturing uh, things and it forces us also to make um, every part of the process uh, more uh, unified more transparent and easier to use for anyone involved, front-end, back-end, database, um, engineers, etc. Um, we launched the company in 2006, but we didn't have an API until 2008. And launching an API is a bit like planting a seed. You um, launch this thing out to, into the wild. You don't know how people are going to use it. You don't know if it has the right features. You don't know who your clients are. So it's like a, a separate product almost that you have to cater for, you have to create a community around, you have to convince people that your API is worth using. Uh, so that's really the spirit we had at the time. I think we only had three developers in 2008 when we launched it. So we launched very quickly in about two months, we had our first API. Um, there were a lot fewer standards at the time. So if you look at our API today, you'll see remnants of that non-standardization. Um, a lot happened in the last five years. Uh, APIs have become so common. Everybody has one. Everybody needs one. Uh, a lot of companies are pure API players. That wasn't really the case at the time. So we did with our limited means. And we the entire platform was uh, one code base, one database at the time. So we did what came naturally, and we built a monolithic service. Uh, I think up to now, most of the API calls are served from one Python files in our repository. Um, that's not great for scalability. That's not great for uh, reuse. There's a lot of things wrong with this model. And we learned that over the next few years. Um, but then a great thing happened. People started using our API. And from zero in 2008, we started to see a pretty exponential growth up until now. We've had more than 10,000 applications use our API to uh, create their own products. Um, with 15% of our ticket sales are coming from events that had some touch point with the API. It might be users that were um, acquired through a MailChimp integration, might be uh, organizers using the WordPress integration to publish their site. Um, there's a lot of entry points into our service. It doesn't mean that every event uh, was created through the API, but somehow we gained that user uh, thanks to our API. And when you sell a billion dollars worth of tickets a year, that's about 150 million. So the API for us has become this very um, monetizable product that enhances the offering. Um, but as, as our API matured, we, we forgot to do one very important thing. Um, we didn't need our own dog food. And that's a mistake I think a lot of companies make. They create as they grow because of lack of resources, because of lack of vision, because of lack of planning. 
they don't use their own APIs. And in the end, when you do that, you end up with um, something like that. Our application grew into this monster with so many features, so many different tweaks here and there. If you're a user, you probably see the platform and, and you see all the features that are built in. But the API stayed behind, and currently, not all functionality is available through the API. Actually, a lot of functionality is not, because we didn't take the time to build it for ourselves. So we haven't, uh, we've been too busy doing other things to uh, really care for the API and add it there, or we haven't had demand. So when you put yourself in this position, you have to wait for someone important, like a big client or someone who has weight uh, on your management to take the time to add it to your API. And that's not the right way to scale a platform. So at the beginning, at the beginning of uh, early last year, we sat down with the entire architecture team. We thought about where we were and where we wanted to be and how we would bridge the gap between the two, because we now um, are fully behind our API. That wasn't the case for a couple of years. We kind of left it there. It was working. People were complaining. They were using it. But I don't think we were reaching our full potential. So we decided to scrap a lot of the things we had done and completely rewrite the API and change our architecture to a more distributed uh, architecture with a lot more services. So what is a service? Um, it's a discrete and separate unit that each concern themselves with the concepts, data, and actions of a specific and narrowly defined area. And we put something on the map, like how do we think about our product? What are the individual pieces we can extract from this giant code base that we had? So there were the basics, like the technical services, caching, queuing, session management, task management, sending emails, uh, notifications, all these things, we broke them out and created separate services um, to run them. So instead of having a library in Python that does some of this and that can't be reused in another repository for, from your big data team, for example, we have this external service that anybody can use and it takes care of only of technical things. And then there's domain services, and we took a hard look at uh, the mishmash of our code base and all the different domains that were addressed within that uh, one unified code base and tried to extract concepts that could be uh, abstracted and put into individual services that are fully independent. So we're building inventory uh, services, we're building authentication services, user services, event services. The first one we started with was our payment service. Uh, we wanted to plug in a new payment provider and we, it actually was much harder without a service than with a service. So we decided to write the service first, then plug in the payment provider later. Um, and then everything else is just a thin layer on top of the uh, services, even the API itself. Uh, it will have an interface to translate the request from the clients into something, the, um, into the right calls to the right services and aggregate the data together back to serve it back to the client. So everything, including the website, the admin tools, our mobile API as well that uses, uh, that is used by our applications. Um, cron, cron jobs, etc., will use the services and only the services. So, what are the benefits? Um, first of all, you gain reusability across the board. Any of your teams can use it, regardless of whether they program in Python or Java or, or pure front end. They can use those services because we built them in a way that um, you don't need to know about the details of the implementation to use them. Uh, you can also um, compose them much faster than you used uh, to do it before. You can combine them, you can um, use the d data from different services and send the emails to another service, for example, and all this uh, by writing a few lines of codes instead of uh, entire libraries. Um, I think most importantly, you gain autonomy and you can really focus on, on the core uh, fundamentals of that service. Um, putting aside um, 
the product itself, you can think about what are the requirements for that service to be fully independent, to have its own language, to have its own uh, storage. If everything is independent about the service. And you start thinking a lot more abstractly when you do that. Uh, you forget about what the application is supposed to do, and you try to make your service as flexible and generic as possible. And that allows for things like uh, with our payment service, we'll soon be able to uh, allow external trusted vendors or organizers to uh, use it for their own uh, payment structure, for example. So having that separate service opens up new potential for monetization down the line. It's not something we'll do right away, but that's something that's possible now. Um, it's also stateful only as needed. So it, each service keeps track of its own state. For example, the payment service keeps track of whether the payment has been approved, where if there's a char chargeback on it, et cetera, et cetera. The application doesn't need to care about that. And that's a big change. We uh, were able to remove a lot of the code that was in our application code and put it into the service where it belongs, really. Um, and then you can have different methodologies to connect with the services. Uh, I'll show afterwards what we did to uh, make it a lot easier to uh, call the service by different means, to get data in different formats, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that needs to be thought through. And we spend a lot of time on the service layer itself before we build the services to make sure it's reusable across the board and in the various applications that we have. And then it makes uh, writing cross-platform and third-party integrations a lot easier. Uh, when you, once you have those services available, uh, it's really ups, up to the application team to decide which ones to use and how. And then you gain a lot on operational scale, and that's the major gain that we had. We had a growing database that was running and storing pretty much everything in our application. Um, now we have these independent databases that only care about payments or only care about our user authentication. And that allows us to create separate data stores and use the right data store for each service. So we're spawning a lot of new servers, database servers or Cassandra servers to keep track of different types of information and scale them independently. So instead of this giant MySQL database that we had that kept going and wasn't going to shrink anytime soon, uh, we took out the data that made sense and put it its, its, so into its own repository. And then it makes test, testing a lot easier. You only have to care about uh, business rules. You don't have to care how it looks. You don't have to care how it integrates with the app. You reduce the scope so much that you can write only the tests that make sense for that service. And they're much faster to run as well because they're independent for the, from the application code base and, <coughs> and test. So you can write much smaller, much more targeted uh, tests uh, to run against that service. So we spend a lot of time on, on the service layer. Uh, we wanted that layer to be critical to any service. We wanted it to be used by any service. So it defines the framework in which how applications, third-party developers, APIs connect with those services. And we made it so that you can have different uh, type of response delivery, for example. You can have um, asynchronous callbacks. You can have polling. You can have uh, wait for the re return of the API, uh, the service call. So all these are defined when you make the call. You can just launch the uh, service request and forget about it, and or you can come back later, pull for the results, and then change the display accordingly. That allows you to break the latency that uh, is involved in having external services um, that might be on separate servers. Um, we also abstracted the communication between uh, the, co the application code and the service. So you can decide if you want to make it a code as a library in Python, that's something we launched with. We didn't know how uh, having remote serv servers would impact our uh, payment service, for example. So we decided that we needed to be able to call the services directly from Python. Now we've moved all our payment servers to separate batch run under uh, behind HA proxy, and we can determine that in the application code how we want to call it. Um, 
we can also do intelligent routing. We can have different sets of servers in different availability, availability zones. Uh, we started doing that as well. And uh, that um, makes it a lot more flexible to build services that can scale. And then we wanted to be able to do many things at once with uh, one service call. And that's something that's not really common in other frameworks. So you can pass a set of actions and read the results at the end of each action independently. Uh, that allows you to do a lot more with one call and not wait and make multiple requests back and forth to get the end result that you need. Um, you can also uh, control versioning a lot better. Uh, I think you've all been bitten by uh, bugs when you launch a, uh, a feature that's dependent on some older code that's out there. Uh, with versioning, you can roll back easily. You can have uh, different sets of versions running at the same time. You can have a lot more flexibility. Um, finally, uh, not finally, but almost, traceability and debugging. That having this completely separate code base that uh, is run with its own data store allows you to uh, find problems much faster than you would before. Um, you can uh, pinpoint exactly where it's, where, what's happening where and where the problem is. Um, error handling also is handled at the service layer. Uh, everything is um, uniform across all services, so the application can have systematic behavior across all the different services, and that makes it easier to develop. And once you're familiar with the service architecture, um, you can use it across multiple different services. Um, governance is also pretty important. Um, the only place where the business logic is for uh, payments, for example, is in the payment service. You won't find it in the app anymore. You won't find it in the mobile application front end, for example. That forces you to extract all the relevant content that matters for your domain and put it in the right place, which is where it belongs. And finally, you can have different levels of security for different services. Um, as you know, payments are much more critical than Facebook Connect data, for example. Um, so you can have different levels of PCI compliance, for example, for different sets of servers, uh, which, again, increases flexibility in your platform overall. At the same time that we build those services, we this decided that our API needed a refresh. So we started from scratch. We uh, started a new code base using the Django REST framework. Our entire platform was on Django for the most part with some Java as well. Um, but we needed to get up with the program. Uh, standards have changed. People have a lot more unified and uniform way of calling APIs these days. And we needed to be up a par with that. So we had wanted to rewrite everything. Uh, we also wanted to make it backwards compatible to our first version, which is not quite RESTful, which has different authentication methods. Um, so we spent some time so that we didn't have to discontinue your integrations before launching the new version. So we currently are close to launching our new version, and uh, it will be fully backwards compatible. And then any new API calls is using the services. You, you, we're not writing code specifically for the API call anymore. We have to call a service. Uh, the main goal is to reach feature parity with the web platform. We uh, have a lot missing from the API, so we're building those first. And then we'll be adding a lot more new functionality there. Uh, we also have, have some basics that are missing currently, webhooks. I mean, that's a great way of scaling. Uh, we have. Uh, organizers are able to pull their attendee list, for example, from the API. And currently, they have to call every minute or so to get an updated list. So with webhooks, we can get rid of all these calls and tell them when a new attendee signs up. Uh, so it's a big saving for us. It's a big saving for them as well, not having to implement this. And then forward thinking, we're uh, very interested in the if, then, then, that. Uh, model, we think it could be a great way to enhance our platforms. Like if someone signs up on Eventbrite, then add them to Salesforce or add them to your CRM or send them an email through Gmail. All these things, I think, make the API reach a much broader audience. It can be anyone in the room, especially if the UI matches the functionality. So I think that's 
really the way of the future for thinking beyond programmatic access to your code and make it uh, make a UI for it. So that's about it. We still have a lot to do. I mean, it's it's a work in progress. Building these services take a lot of time. Take take a lot of resources, take a lot of commitment from your management that you're gonna be not focusing on features for a while but rewriting some old code that's now obsolete. So you have to convince your um, directors or whoever runs your company that it's a worthwhile effort. But I think it's the only way to grow beyond a certain level. You can go get by as you launch startup for the first few years with simple code bases, simple APIs, but down the line you want really the API to be the power behind your platform. And that takes all these things to make it happen. And as you scale, then you need to be able to control your data expansion. And I think that's what services give you uh, as an add-on. So that's, that's about it. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, I hope that's what our architecture will look like in, in a few months. Was it uh, the pressure to do this uh, API overhaul and, and get your own systems on, was this more internal pressures or external pressures to do this? Was it within your company and, and because of the problems you were facing at scale or is it your partners and your customers asking for it that caused, caused you ultimately to change your ways? Doesn't work, yeah. Um, it's mostly internal, so our, our external users don't really see the, the back end. They just know what is, what's exposed. They don't really care what, how it works, really. And they want an API. We have many requests for the API to become, uh, up, uh, to, to catch up with the product, that's for sure. But we could have decided to keep going the way we had done before and add it to that one file that manages everything. But as we grew the team, I think that we realized that we need to be um, a lot more flexible and a lot more thorough into developing a particular domain. And so it was mostly internal. And I think it's something that you need to do at some point as your team grows, just so that you can focus your engineers on one thing and one particular thing and nothing else, and really put down the business rules. Cause I, that's one thing that's easy to put in the front end at the beginning, some rules, like if you're in Australia, you need to show provinces. That's something that's very easily put into the front end when it should be really in the back end. And that forces you to do this effort. And this way there's no um, question when the coder writes it. It's in the API, in the service documentation. It is, it's only in one place and you cannot find it anywhere else. And there's, there's only one way to apply it. So it allows you to scale your team as much as your product as well. So why did you guys decide to support EFT? I'm just curious, what was the reasoning behind that? Um, I think it's to reach beyond developers. If you build a UI in front of your API to do things that are not possible without knowing how to program, it makes your platform a lot more powerful. And it abstracts all the integrations with outside services. Uh, otherwise, you have to write code to do it. And most of our uh, users don't know how to write code. So you're limiting your API's potential reach to people who know coding. And I, I think that concepts makes it a lot more powerful to bring your platform to the, to the next level and increase usage eventually and increase ticket sales. I mean, that's what we're, why we're doing that. And that's something people want nowadays. Like they want to be, be able to integrate all their services. We just signed up a bit as run, I don't know if you've heard of Tough Mudder, it's a race in the, in the mud. It's very popular nowadays in, in the US and it's coming to Europe as well. So they have a lot of sales, uh, all of, uh, a lot of, lot of runs all over the year. 
but they have several systems that they use to manage their customers, to manage their sales, to manage their um, actual production. And we needed to be able to integrate somehow with all these different providers. So I think that uh, concept allows you to do that a lot more easily and for all your clients if you do it the right way.